Hi there, and welcome to Project Resurrection, the podcast. And I'm your host, Chaplain Sai Ali. Through all its ups and downs, the Homewood section of Pittsburgh has remained a neighborhood where togetherness is a cherished value. Like all inner city communities around the country, Homewood certainly has its share of issues. However, there are those shining points of bright light in all the communities around our country where there are those that are charged to help others. One of them is my guest tonight, Deacon, Mr. Thomas Gilcrease, who has worked to spread a positive influence on the community. Now he is in charge of helping others, especially young people to leave their own lasting legacies. Thomas actually grew up in the Homewood section with both sides of his family coming from the Homewood area. He attended Crescent Elementary School on Bennett Street in Homewood, and he continued his education at nearby Penn Hills High School District. Thomas has been involved in community mentorship, fellowship, and ministry since his teenage years. In his youth, he discovered the service of calling as part of Bethany Baptist Church. He joined the Church Youth Christian Conquerors Program, the YCC, and in 2001, he received the opportunity to work as a summer missionary in Mexico at 14 years old. His ability to bring teenagers from around Homewood and the surrounding area, encouraging them to participate in Bible study and church activities allowed for the expansion of YCC. After returning to Pittsburgh from Liberty University, where he studied psychology with a focus in child and adolescent development, Thomas began heading up the YCC program as its youth pastor. In addition to regular programming for Homewood children, he also takes, he took his students to Summer Best two weeks camp, a co-ed Christian sports summer program. His involvement in the church and YCC not only strengthened his love of God, but his community, and it also honed in his extremely talented leadership skills. Through Bethany Baptist, he has made connections with several community groups in and around the Homewood area. Thomas was ordained as a deacon, and he's currently the vice president of the deacon board at Bethany Baptist Church. He continues to minister young people and other members of the church as a mentor, and most importantly, a friend. He's helped the community with projects such as building neighborhood programs and playgrounds through Kaboom, spending his time with young people, and just outright being one of the better mentors who I have come across. Thomas received his master's degree in education from Liberty University and is currently pursuing a doctorate's degree in educational psychology at Regent University. However, he's still motivated by friends and family and neighbors in Homewood to continue his outstanding service. His wish is to see the community embrace and exceed its potential. The relationships he's built with young people has made a lasting impact on their lives. And most recently, I became to know Thomas very well as he is a uh, psychology and counselor at Penn Hills High School, his alma mater, where I'm also working there as a youth mentor. And as soon as I met Thomas, I knew that I wanted him as a guest on the podcast. Thomas, welcome to Project Resurrection, the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, man. You know, there's so much for us to cover but just, I want to just go back a little bit. Talk, talk about growing up in Homewood. You know, you're a little bit younger than me, but I'm sure you've seen the city, you know, the, the community kind of change in, in different ways. How was it like growing up in Homewood? Yeah, so um, so it's it's kind of weird because my um, to I live with my parents and we lived on the 500 block of Paulson Avenue, which is down the street from Mount Air, which that section of the city is East Liberty, Larmer. Right. Um, which is yes. which is Homewood, right? So, yep. and then the church, you know, was on the other parallel to my grandmother's house, um, which was on Tioga. So, spending time in both places, um, you know. So, I grew up in the nineties, right? So, yep. you know, because of all those all the different things going on in in the nineties, sure. um, you know, we weren't. My grandmother, you say, well, you can't go down, you know, but so far, you know, right. <laughs> you can't really go outside and play. Just yeah, certain times of the day, you know, right. and um, it's I mean same same thing, you know, when I lived when I was with being my parents, um, couldn't go down the street, right. you know, you couldn't. Um, there was, sure. um, you know, we weren't 
my grandmother you say, well, you can't go down, you know, but so far, you know, right. you can't really go outside and play, especially at certain times of the day, you know. Right. And um, it's I mean, same same thing, you know, when I lived when I was with being with my parents, um, couldn't go down the street. Right. You know, you couldn't. Um, there was uh, times where my father wouldn't let me even. Uh, times where my father wouldn't let me even. Um, I think my parents did a good job from shielding me from all those things, sure. from shielding me, my brother, my sister from all those things. Um, you know, didn't, definitely didn't want us to get involved, but definitely didn't right. put us in harm's way either. Um, now, you know, in 98, we moved to Penn Hills and it was a total new, <laughs> new atmosphere. Right, know? right. I'm sure. Um, we weren't, you know, we weren't hearing gunshots or, you know, people screaming at alleyways or different things like that. It was definitely a different environment. Even the school was different. Right. There was times where my father wouldn't let me even outside in the backyard um, just because of, you know, all the different things going on. So, right. Um, I think my parents did a good job from shielding me from all those things. Sure. From shielding me, my brother, my sister from all those things. Um, you know, didn't, definitely didn't want us to get involved, but definitely didn't right. put us in harm's way either. Um, now, you know, in 98, we moved to Penn Hills and it was a total new, <laughs> new atmosphere. Right, know? right. I'm sure. Um, we weren't, you know, we weren't hearing gunshots or, you know, people screaming at alleyways or different things like that. It was definitely a different environment. Even the school was different. Right. During um, the different programs that we had at the church. Um, so we always stay connected to the friends that I had at Crescent. Um, we didn't, you know, always over time, you know, things fade and you right. know, as you go, as you try to pursue different dreams and different things like that, but yes, sir. Things fade and you right. know, as you go, as you try to pursue different dreams and different things like that, but yes, sir. Um, you still, you know, um, you still, you know, maintain those friendships, you know, through, you know, a while after, after I moved, you know, for fifth and fifth in the middle of fifth grade. So it was definitely it was definitely a culture shock um, going to Penn Hills. Um, that was my first time seeing, you know, white having white kids in the same classroom. Right. <laughs> you know, it was that that was definitely different. Um, you know, you know, like I said, walk into a classroom, you see like all these white kids, and you're like, what? That was <laughs> a know, culture like, shock. Uh, that sounded like, like a culture shock. Gonna, right. Yeah. Like oh, they go to school too. You know, because um, we because we didn't we didn't have. Um, you know, from kindergarten to fifth grade, we didn't have white students right. in, um, in our classrooms. Sure. You know, it was, yeah. it was all, all black neighborhood, um, you know, all black neighborhood school. You know, of course, we had like, you know, white teachers and white principals and different things like that. But but no students. Um, we didn't have white students, yeah. you know, so uh, it was so it went from seeing, you know, white people as authority figures to as solely authority figures to, OK, you know, these, you know, they're also students as well. You know, right. so um going yeah, so like going to Penn Hills was def definitely different. So that but, was a transition for you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And it was a, and it was a time. So it was it's funny because so March of ninety eight is when I moved to Penn Hills. So I was finished out my fifth grade year at Penn Hills. So Linton, we went to uh, Linton Middle School in um in the fall, in the fall of ninety eight. And I started at sixth grade. And I'm walking, uh, it's after school, after the first day of school, I'm walking to the um, to my bus and this kid comes up from behind me and slaps me in the back of the head. And and I'm automatically starting to get upset. I'm like, man, who just hit me in the back of the head? So I turn around and it's one of my friends that I went to Crescent with. And he was like, yo, what's up? You know, all this, you know I'm like, hey man, like, how you doing, you know? And then he said, yeah, he said, you come to Pills now? I was like, yeah, you come to Pills? Yeah. They were like, oh, what bus you ride? And he told me he bus me. I said, I ride that bus too. And we got on the bus together and we right. just, you know, chop, you know, chop it up the whole way, uh, the whole right. way home. Because I, I haven't seen him since March, but now it's August. But then he tells me, you know, like uh, almost half our classmates who's who we were in fifth grade, now they're at Linton, Okay. So okay. the next, the very next day, we all found each other. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, we, and we just, yeah, man, we just really, um, we, we kicked it, man, for the rest of the sixth grade year. Because um, it was, you know, it was like that, that, Outstanding. Man, like these, yeah, these are my, you know, we would, 
we went to school from kindergarten to fifth grade together. Yeah. You know, so we, we were together, you know, all throughout our, you know, basically our whole academic lives. So seeing each other in sixth grade, that was, you know, it felt, it helped the transition to middle school. For Got me. you. So Bethany Baptist was kind of like the, the glue that kept you in tune to what was going on in Homewood. Was that, was that yeah, kind of the case? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we, um, so when I, when I moved, um, cause like I said, I went to Crescent, but when I moved, you know, going, still going to the church and we were, you know, all the Wednesday, you know, we had Wednesday night programs. We had, um, sometimes we had, uh, sleepovers and, you okay. know, all those different types of things. So the kids that I would see at Crescent at school was still coming. They were coming to the church, you know, to, gotcha. the, to different okay. programs. So we, you know, it was easy to maintain those, those relationships. Very good. You know, um, and, and then even when we went to high school, even when I went to high school at Penn Hills, um, the, the church had like this basketball program and we had the basketball program every week where okay. kids, and we had the basketball program every week where okay. kids from all over the city will come and play basketball. Right. So, you know, we were able to maintain relationships as well. Um, so, yeah, so the church was definitely the, um, you know, the glue, at, you know, growing up was definitely the glue that helped me, you know, stay close to um, to the people who I grew up with. Absolutely. Now, it's, you know, I was reading, you know, the intro says, I mean, you, your calling came at an early age. And I was joking with mm -hmm. you off air that I only wish that my calling came <laughs> as young as yours did. Yeah. How, how did that come about? When did, when did you start believing that, man, this, this is something here. God's kind of got his finger on me. How, how early was it that you realized, man, that you were, you were on to something here? Well, I would, I would say, um, I realized, I realized it, I would say 10, 11. Wow. -ish. Even earlier. Yeah. Yeah. 10, 11 ish. Okay. But, right. um, my family and people around me, they knew, you know, when I was about three, four years old. Wow. Um, yeah, they would tell me stories about, you know, so like at my, my grandmother's house, she had, you know, I don't know if you're familiar, like the houses at Homewood were like yes. these three floor houses. Yes, houses, absolutely. Right? Where steps was, you know, like the stairway to heaven, right? right. Um, and she told me, they they tell me that I would line it to my grandmother. She used to watch the kids in the neighborhood and even from the church. And um, I would line up all the kids on the steps and I would say, hey, you know, let's go have church, right? And I'm, and I'm preaching, I'm preaching to the kids, but I'm really regurgitate, you know, what I heard from, right. you know, from previous sermons from being at church and I was sure. just talking, you know, or just saying random stuff. Right. Uh -huh. Um, and that was how they, that that's how they perceived it. That's how they knew that, you know, I was called to preach or, or called to go into the ministry. Um, and then they tell me a story. So when I was about, I would say probably about, uh, I had to be about five years old, maybe, uh, the church took a um, mission trip to Nova Scotia, Canada, mm -hmm. and and we worked up there, you know, doing some things. Help. Um, this one missionary would like, um, camp, you know, like um, vacation Bible school type camps and stuff like that. Right. And um, so I'm sitting in a trailer, and I'm reading, and um, there's, I have this book in my hand, and I'm just like saying a bunch of words from the book, right? And this one, <laughs> this one lady from our church is. Um, her, I think her name is Miss West. God rest her soul, Miss West. And she hears, she so she looks at me and she thinks I'm reading this book. And she goes and she starts telling people, everybody come here. He's reading from the, he's reading from the Bible. He's reading from the word and all this stuff. So people start coming because they know I'm like four or five years old. Like he right. can't even read it, you know? And so she, in her, in her mind, I'm reading from this book, you know, declaring the word of God. And right, things. right. And then somebody came in and said, man, that book is upside down. He ain't reading that. <laughs> oh, no. But that was like, yeah, That's... but that was like their, but that was like their, you know, like that was like their, um, their perception of, you know what, he's supposed to go into the ministry. Yes. But, it, um, but it really didn't hit me until, um, there's this one lady from our church. She she had passed away a few years ago. Her name is Miss Blessing Game, and she she looked at me and um, 
I, you know what, I can't remember. I can't remember if it was a Sunday after service or if it was during missions conference or something. I, I really can't remember what the occasion was or why we were at the church. But she looked at me, I was, I was in high school, and she looked at me and she said, you are a young Charles Spurgeon. And it was like my calling um, into the ministry. Right. Okay, yeah. So yeah. that um, so listening to to Miss Blessing Game um tell me, you know, that I was a young Charles Spurgeon, um, that hit that hit different. Um now explain and, to our and, audience who Charles Spurgeon was. So yeah, yeah, so he was he was his, um a preacher and he he was responsible for you know, different um, movements, um, revivals, you know, different things like that. So when she said that, it just, like, it hit, it hit me differently, right? And right. it was something that I couldn't forget. It was something that, that um, I always remember, you know, you know how you remember people for certain things that they say, and right. that was something, you know, that she said that spoke life into me. And I never, <laughs> I never forgot. You know, that resonated that with never you. Forget. Yeah. So that certainly resonated yeah. with you. Yeah. Yep. And it's, <laughs> like I said, it still resonates it's with powerful. me. powerful. That is a powerful statement. Reson- yep. It still re- resonates with me. And that, yeah, that's something that I'll never forget. So at that point, you knew wh- wh- mm-hmm. where you were heading in. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's what um kind of pushed me to to attend a uh, liberty university okay um cause, you know because i knew i was going to be able to get the education there i knew that i right. was going to be able to be around people who will help me you know go in that direction and um you know there was some you know testimonial things you know i'm sure yes, absolutely. College, it, it is a college campus um but you know god's grace is sufficient you know at me, at me. How was your experience at Liberty University? Uh, it was good. It was good. Um, my first my first three years were, were very were very good. Um, you know the you know how they say the people that you meet in college will be your friends for life. Um, right. There's there's guys there's people that I met in college that were friends for life. Very you good. Know, we still talk. We still talk today. And I graduated right. 2000 and fall 2000 and I'm sorry I graduated fall 2009. Okay. We're still friends to this day. Beautiful, you know, um, beautiful. And you know, so my first three years were very, were very good. Um, now my last year was a little rough. You oh, know? really? How so? It, it was, a, it was a little rough. Um, that's, that's that. You know, that was uh, fall two thousand and eight when Obama got elected. Okay. <laughs> it lets you remember. It brings you back to reality of you know this is still you know a concern because it because. Liberty University is in Lynchburg, Virginia, and yep. you know it's um, that you know conservative southern, right. yes, know, and um, it it brings you it brings you back to the, you know to how the world is, right? Um, you know, especially when Obama got elected, there was a lot of stuff that went on that um, that a lot of people felt, you know, particularly black people that yeah um, that were there on campus at the time you know, felt unsafe and different right. things like that, you know, but it was one of those things where you kind of, you kind of, you learn, you learn different things, right? You Absolutely. Things life. You learn how, you know, certain things play, when you see that certain things play out, but at the same time, it teaches you that resiliency, right? You, you sure. Learn res- you, you know, you learn resiliency through adversity. Yes. And that was one of the most ad- adverse situations that I've ever. Been I can in. imagine. And um, I can imagine. Yeah, you know, because it's that that it's if it, because it, it felt like the world, right? Because um, we used to call it the Liberty Bubble. Because once you on that hill, don't so nothing else matter. <laughs> you know, right. you know, right. Because you on that hill. Yeah. But that was one of the few times where you know, the world seemed to seep into the into Exactly. The, right. So, but, but yeah. But, you know, but, but that's a part of life to, experience though. You you got to see course. that. And that's something you may not have gotten had you not been there and of experienced course. that yeah. time. Because I'm sure around the country, there was, there was animosity of having 
uh, the nation's first black president, but where mm -hmm. you were at in that section of the country, I'm sure it may have, mm -hmm. was it amplified a little bit there? Oh yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, yeah. it was It was definitely amplified, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, for us, you know, especially for the uh, black students who are there, you know, it's crazy because you, you hear stories, you know, from our grandparents, right? So my grandmother uh, passed away in 2018. She was 95 years old, right? Bless so her heart, 95. You remember, yeah, man. So she remembered, you know, she was born in the 20s. And yes. So she lived through the 30s, through the 40s, through the 50s. Right. So she remembers all that stuff, right? And she told, she told me, she said, you know, she said, I remember. I remember everything. Okay, she said, this is important, you know, so as a, you know, 20 year old kid, you don't really understand the magnitude of that type of event until you sit down and talk to somebody right. who, who lived through the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, yes. right? And then as a young person, you start to understand why that's important. But when you sit down with people from other cultures who haven't experienced what we experienced, they don't understand why that event for us was important. Right. You know? Yes. So, um, so, and that's, and, that, and to be honest with you, that's what, that's what I think it was. You know, a lot of people just didn't understand, you sure. know, yeah. from why, why, why for us it was important. Um, you know, we all come from different cultures, different backgrounds. Yes. We all come from, you know, different different um, experiences, but we can all learn the same thing about the, from the experiences that we had. Absolutely. And, and that was one of them to where um, it was an opportunity to kind of learn from other people, but, you know, some people didn't, which led to, you know, a lot of adverse situations for a lot of the black students who lived on campus. But, um, Understood. Hey, I don't want to let this situation. I, I got. I've mm -hmm. got to ask you this question too. Oh, I'm yeah, gonna yeah. back. I'm gonna backtrack. I want to mm -hmm. know about this trip to Mexico and how at 14 oh, yeah. years old. <laughs> at 14, how did this trip? How did you process this trip? That had to be an interesting a, a trip of a lifetime. Yeah, it it was. It was, man. We um. So when I was 14 years, yeah, when I was 14 years old, summer 2001. Um, our youth pastor um, wanted to take a trip to Mexico. We were going to help go to Juarez, Mexico, to help uh, build a church um, for, um, for people in Mexico. And at first, I wasn't going to go because uh, I was scared to fly. Oh, really? Um, I <laughs> really? was I'm terrified, terrified. See, that's the I love roller coasters, but uh, it was something about flying that right. I just couldn't get I, with. I, I couldn't get with it. Um, and then uh, I think at that time, I don't know if you remember, what was the flight? Um, I can't remember what it was, what that, what it was called. But remember, you remember TWA? Yes. The, the flight 800. Yeah. Flight 800. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Flight, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so our youth pastor said, yeah, we're flying TWA. So I was freaked out, freaked out. Um, so my cousin, was a missionary to Africa for 30 years. Okay. okay. And she um she had happened to be home um, you know, come home uh for to spend some time, you know, with family and everything. Right. She went back to Africa. And I told her, you know, I'm scared, I'm scared to fly. And she um she sat down with me, she prayed with me, and she talked to me about flying. And then I decided to go. Good. Um, and I'm glad I went, man, because it it was an amazing trip. Like we got into Mexico and, you know, we hooked up, you know, with the translators and everything right. they gave was kind of the, the rules of, you know, what, what to do, what not to do in Mexico. Sure. And it was, you know, for me, one of the best time of our life, you know, my mother came with me. Oh, good. Um, good. To, and, you know, yeah, man, we helped build them churches and stuff. And, and, you know, um, the people that I went with <laughs> were absolutely amazing good um, we had a good we had a good time on that trip you know we um and, and i think that's one of the trips too that that really you know because like when you go on a mission trip you know how you got to serve and you got to right. bless other people sure um but you know you, god always pushes in situations where when you bless other people you get blessed too you right? do so, indeed um, indeed 
So yeah, it was definitely a blessed time. You know, we um, it was funny because the people there gave us all nicknames. Oh, <laughs> so, oh, oh what was what was your yeah. nickname? So I, I had a few, right? So this guy, he this this this, uh, this guy from down from down there, he um, he told me and my friend, he said, hey um, we're gonna take you wanna go to Six Flags? So you know, we're like, oh y'all got a Six Flags out here in Mexico? Like you know, like let's, <laughs> let's go, right? So. He said, yeah, well, we're going to throw away this trash on the way. So me, me and my friend got in the back of this pickup truck, okay? And we drove up this sandy hill. We got to the top of the hill. He said, we're at Six Flags. And we looked around, and there was a broken down Ferris wheel and, like, a couple other things, like, a couple other things. And we just started cracking up laughing. And he started laughing. He was like... You know, it was funny. Like, so they they felt comfortable enough right. to you know to relate with us like that. Exactly. And it was yeah. It, it, man, we we had a great time. We had a great time. Um, and it's Thomas. It's so important for folks to get to see other cultures. And and I've been so yeah. blessed that I've gotten to travel all over the world as a protection agent, and just the life experiences and seeing other cultures and being able to le- learn to appreciate other cultures. I just think that's so important. And I, I wanted to bring that story up because when I saw that uh, in your background, I, I knew. But hey, what was your what was the nicknames, though? I, I can't let you get away without hearing some of the nicknames. <laughs> so, he, so one of mine was Six Flags. Oh, was Six Flags. He called me Six Flags. He called me Six Flags. Yep. Beautiful. He called me Six Beautiful. Flags. But you know what? The, that trip, I will honestly say, see, that trip is the reason why I don't eat Taco Bell. Right. Yeah. When you had real Mexican food, yes, sir. I can't, I can't come back to even yes, eat Taco Bell. Absolutely. I had, I had, they had, they gave me a real burrito. I was yes. like, oh no, nah, this is, this is, it's completely totally different. I haven't yeah. eaten Taco Bell since two thousand and one. <laughs> Good, because you know you can appreciate authentic. You can appreciate oh, yeah. authentic. Now I just oh, give yeah. you a quick story because I, I don't drink anymore, but when I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was working in Manzanillo, Mexico. It's down on the Pacific coast. Okay. And we were, we were with, a, I was with a bunch of executives and we were having dinner one evening and at, at dinner, I ordered a, um, a Corona, or no, a, uh, what's the Mexican beer? Not Corona. Yeah. Corona. I ordered a Corona. Mm-hmm. Thomas, every, the Mexican staff looked at me like I was a knucklehead. They were shaking yeah. and rolling. I said, what's wrong? They were like, we don't drink Coronas down here. <laughs> They're like, that's yep. only you people in the States. We drink Modelo's uh-huh. and they, I drank yep. a Modelo. And exactly. It was authentic. Exactly. But they laughed. I mean, and it's just those little things that you do in the interaction with folks in other countries that, that mm-hmm. really, I, I did definitely wanted to, for you to hit on that story. Now, your youth pastor, you yeah. obviously a beacon of light for these mm-hmm. young people. Um, mm-hmm. How I mean, that you're expansive. I mean, just dealing with these kids, how did your youth pastor, how did that come into play with you now being a high school counselor? It's almost like the, you've taken the steps of progression of dealing yeah. with young people. How did you, now, once you finish school, how did you come upon the high school role, which you're doing right now at Penn Hills High School? Oh, uh, yeah. So, I um my freshman no not my freshman my senior year of of college I um you know the, I was the um our major my major was psychology okay and child and adolescent development and every student in order to get you know to finish the program had to had to intern somewhere in some in some okay. shape or form well excuse me in mm-hmm. psychology counseling you know something something in that in that field and um. So, you know, I was like, hey, you know, I'm looking through the through the manual to see like the different positions and different things you can do with counseling and psychology. And I saw a school counselor, you know. So I said, hey, let me, you know, let me see, let me see what this is about. So right. um, on our school campus, we had a um, there's a, um, a K through 12 school. So um, I called them and interned with him. And I instantly fell in love with the position. Instantly fell in love with the position. I said, you know what? This is what I want to do. Wow. And um, and he was this um the guy who I interned with, he was amazing. You know, I seen how he interacted with the students and right. 
um, I seen how he related to the students and he was just, um, and, that, and that school had students from, you know, from Africa and um, Japan, China, Korea. And I seen how he related to, how he was able to relate to the different different cultures. Wow, um, yeah. I was like, you know what? That's, his name was Mr. Wagner. His name is Mr. Wagner. Mm-hmm. And um, I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. And um, so once I graduated in the, uh, December 2009, I, um, I immediately, that January, I was in the bachelor program. I mean, I was in the master's program of education and oh, school counseling. Beautiful, counsel. yeah. And um, once I graduated, I, um, I went to West Mifflin and I interned at West Mifflin. And again, I, you know, we had the intern and we had this awesome intern. She was awesome. And just as it reminded me of Mr. Wagner, just how she was able nice. to relate to this with the students. Uh, right. I graduated. I um I went to West Mifflin and I interned at West Mifflin. And again, I you know, we had the intern and we had this awesome intern. She was awesome. And just as it reminded me of Mr. Wagner, just how she was able nice. to relate to this with the students. Uh, right. Her disposition and you know how she had talked to their parents and everything. It was just it was, you know, she she was awesome. She yeah. was great. Um, and again, that it just kind of reconfirmed for me. Yep, this is what that's I that's where you're at. Talk to their parents and everything. It was just, it was, you know, she she was awesome. She yeah. was great. Um, and again, that it just kind of reconfirmed for me. Yep, this is what that's I that's where you're at. That's your path. You know, yeah, exactly. That's that's gonna be my path. Yeah, how do you, how do you, biblical, I, I biblical, use biblical principles. Biblical, yep. principle. biblical principles. That's interesting. Yep. Yeah. So, like, like for example. Um, Say if, um, I'm trying, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, okay, say, say if a student is having having an issue, you know, with um, with a teacher or with another student, okay. and they're, you know, they want to scream and yell and different things like that, you know. So that's when I have I have this this lesson. It's a, it's a real you know real short lesson, right? That talks about you know. What is it in Proverbs? It talks about um, a soft answer turns away wrath, right? Right. So we talk. So we talk about ways to gently respond to people who provoke, you know, who provoke us, right? Right. Or who we feel or perceive provoked us, you know, yes. to anger. And um, and you know, we we talk about you know some of those things, um, how a gentle answer you know, will turn away wrath. Yes. Right. Um, so you know, we go through like gentle answers, yes. you know, but they don't know that it's a biblical principle. Right. You know that it's a biblical right. principle. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Or, That's brilliant. It's so yeah, brilliant. Yep. Yeah. Or, you know, w- one of the things that we see a lot, you know, we see a lot of students who who, you know, who don't have uh f- have fathers, you know, and um, you know, and a lot of students, you know, are are angry, you know. And, and when I sit down, you know, we talk, I talk to students and they talk about how, you know, how angry they are or how volatile they are, or, you know, or whatever the situation may be, you know, we say, well, and somehow they always talk about, you know, like my dad, this, or my dad, that, and he's not there or he, this, you know, and then a lot of students always ask me, why am I so angry? And, And I can sit down and tell them, I say, well, you know, there's something about fathers that provoke anger in children, right? And one way that fathers provoke anger in children is when they're not there, right? Right. So, and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, like, I get that, right? But they don't know that's a biblical principle. Like, that's exactly. Ephesians 5, where it says exactly. fathers don't provoke your children to anger, right? Yes. So, but he doesn't say that to the moms. He, he, says, he said it to the fathers, right? So, right. Um, you know, so it's using, like, these different biblical principles you know to um to teach you know to teach or to help students how you know how to get through adverse situations that's man that's brilliant i mean i'm learning as you say that because uh, again i've had to catch myself when Mm -hmm. when in the the school district in in mentoring and not get across that line but Mm -hmm. i was writing down as you were saying that because i think that's just a very, very, it's, it's a brilliant way to get your point mm-hmm. across 
by using a biblical reference and not make it, it is, you know, it's the kids don't even see that. And that's right. You know, yep. that's why you have the acumen that mm -hmm. you do. Now you, uh, you are on the front lines and yeah. I told you that before we, we went on air that I see this uh, one week or one day out of the week, but you see this not only five days, but when I was doing the mentor program on Saturdays, you're actually in on Saturdays as well. When we, how, so how did you observe when we went into the quarantine and these young people were isolated and, and doing remote learning? What, at that point, how were you able to still, were you able to still interact with them during, during the remote, the quarantine session? And, and if so, how were you able to do that? Still keep connected to these young people. Oh yeah, so um, so as as the from the youth pastor side, uh, our first our first year, I want to say our first year of, of quarantine, we were able to you know stay connected with our you know with our students. Um, right. We jumped on Zoom and okay, and we we zoomed it you know yeah. for yeah. about I'll say eight to nine months maybe. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but then when students went back to school, and um school was on zoom then that made it difficult because you're talking about you know being on zoom from eight o'clock in the morning to you know three two two o'clock or you know or whatever the right. school day was and yep. then having to do school on the computer as well through edu right. programs like ingenuity or canvas or something like that right and on top of that you know every it seemed like every meeting went to zoom Right or yeah. teams or something like that. So now it's like, okay, well, now I'm zoomed out. <laughs> well, right, I'm zoomed right. out. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So, um, so for the first, you know, the first almost the first year of quarantine, it was it was it was cool. Like it was it was it was good. But after a while it kind of fizzled out. Um so at but at the time when um when COVID first hit, I worked at an alternative school. Oh okay. so okay. So we stayed in contact with our students there. Like we did different things. Like, you know, we had uh, Zoom classrooms. Okay. We even opened up, you know, Zoom group counseling sessions and all those different type of things so that the kids could, you know, have act still have access to us. Yes. Um, without, you know, even if, you know, outside the classroom basically, but still okay. have access to us. But um, we just tried our best to, to show them like hey even though we're not physically here like we're still like we're still here right we still ran um our normal school schedule you know on zoom okay. and we still did our um reward system on zoom like we were okay. sending kids pizzas and all this stuff like oh, okay. we were doing whatever good. like we was doing whatever we had to do to stay yes. connected you know Absolutely. to these students and um and we did it you know i i was calling kids you know we're every every good. week you know, um, just to, just to stay yes. connected, you know, Absolutely. to these students. And, um, and we did it, you know, I, w I will stay connected. Right. You know, and to help them stay connected. And, and like I said, you know, it, it, it worked, you know, it worked because um, our students definitely felt connected. But like I said, after that certain period of time, then you're like, okay, I need a break. From there was a sense of fatigue all the way around with you oh, yeah. as well as the students, I'm sure, oh, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because our students would, you know, were definitely fatigued, you know, from staring at a screen for seven hours a day, you know. Yes. Um, and like you said, you know, from from the um, professional perspective, you know, you sit down, you staring at a screen all day as well. Um, you're going to get fatigued, you know. You're going to get, you know, that that, and it's not even. And I think it was a different type of fatigue because, you know, as teachers or counselors or whatever it is, you know, you kind of have, you know, compassion fatigue. But this one was it was it was as different, you know. Right. It was as different because like it, it's not like you were fatigued from from you know connecting with people, but it was fatigued from just being you know like being in front of a screen. Right? Exactly, so, exactly. Um, I don't know if you want to call that like technology fatigue or I, that's fatigue I think that's or, perfect. That's perfect. Yeah, or, yeah. You know, whatever it is, but. Um, yeah, it was, it was definitely, it, it was definitely, you know, fatigue. Um, yes. So, and, you, and you needed a break after a while. Oh, I, I can and, imagine. Yeah. Now, when, when these young people, when they came back, 
when they, and, and I, I'm sure we had a couple of phases where they came back and then went back out. Did you mm -hmm. notice a difference in their mental capacity when they came back? And, and if so, what, what was it, what was it like dealing with them in person after such a long period of time of not dealing with them face to face? Yeah, I think, um, I, I don't know if students came back, um, I don't, I don't want, okay, I'll put it this way. Like, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if COVID really affected people mentally. Okay. Now, for some okay. students, you know, some students do talk about being alone for a certain period of time, right? Or, you know, being in the house for a certain period of time. Right. You know, those things are definitely real. Um, but I don't know if COVID itself affected young people, okay. um, the you know, mentally, you know, in, in a, huge way and the reason why I say that is because um a lot of you know you drive up and down France a lot of like you still see packs of kids walking together right <laughs> you, yeah. you know what I mean like they sure. still found their way you know because I, I remember driving up and down France and I'm like man like there's like five kids walking together like and none of them got masks on or right. if it really affected people immensely but one thing I, I will say is that it did affect um students and how they do school okay that's like, a good point um, because i know a lot of students came back from the from the pandemic and it's almost from being out of the classroom for over a year right you see it's almost like students forget like how to function in a school environment you know and then with and then with that we're having you know doing school you know over computer a lot of students um didn't you know I, I will say academically kind of slowed down a little bit okay you know? um they're not as far along academically as they should be right but you can't stop time so yeah and you know, what did we, you expect that did you expect that when them when, with the kids coming back or no i mean i i mean I, I, i'll be honest i didn't expect it and okay. the reason why i didn't expect it because with you know, them being the I generation um, and always having some sort of, uh, you know, because the, these students don't know life without a device, like right. without a tablet or without sure. a Amazon Kindle or without Facebook, like they don't know life without Facebook or without this type of technology. So because they're always use, using this technology for other things, um, I didn't, I thought that they would be able to adapt to right. this type of or using this type of technology but it was almost like okay you know when it's for our personal use that's fine but now it's for school and now it's overboard right gotcha. so yes um so i definitely didn't expect a lot of students to come back and not be i know they wouldn't be where they are academically but a lot of students are not as far as they should be i guess got you, you got you um, and and you and we definitely see some of some of that um, in, in our, you know, in our schools. Um, gotcha. And this is schools across across the U.S. I mean, right. Maybe even across the world. You know. Yeah, it's certainly but, not just indicative here locally. I'm sure. Right. If we right. polled and talked to teachers in Denmark or whatever, we probably probably would get the mm -hmm. same situation, right? Yeah, it just came back, right? That's that's kind of almost what it felt like. You know, I love that years. analogy. Where did yeah, you come up with that one, bro? That's a good I'm one. Not, just, just yeah. not, <laughs> you know, like we were going out of school for about a year. We came back yeah. and everybody's like, okay, I, I guess we're back in school, you know? And it just like, yeah, it really being home and ha them having to do school or not just really affected them academically. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I remember my son telling me, you know, and he's, my son is a, a he'll, he's a fifth year senior. He'll be a fifth year senior, mm -hmm. but he was telling me how his grades, his grades, he struggled with his work from, you know, st you know, doing this remotely because he mm -hmm. told me, he was like, I just missed the interaction with the teachers and, you know, yeah. the questions, asking questions and having to process things from a laptop uh, mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh when his school was at Wheeling University in Wheeling, West Virginia. You know, and then I talked to some of the kids, even in, in, in the Penn Hill School District. And, you know, and it's, it's good that you mentioned it's not, they, they didn't necessarily become depressed from this, but it was just maybe 
the lack of interaction and having to learn mm -hmm. remotely. But do you mm -hmm. feel like now, do you see the kids are coming out of that and are they more engaged at this point now in the, in the year? Yeah, but I, yeah, but I also think, you know, you know what they say, there's too, too much of something is not good for you, right? Right. And you're talking about a year, when you talk about a year of not being in school, right? You know, sometimes we just look at it as, oh yeah, you just didn't go to school for a year, right? But I think we also have to look at the other ramifications. And those are, you're talking about free time, okay? You're talking about now having too much free time on your hands, right? You're talking about having you're talking about hey can you can you flip can you put your camera up a little bit you were fake you're um, oh yeah just so i can see okay there we go perfect, perfect yep perfect yeah okay yeah cool. you're talking about you know too much free time being mm -hmm. in a position to where you don't have the the stress of responsibility or the stress of having to meet deadlines or the right. stress of solving issues or you know being in those type of that academic environment Mm -hmm. So now you're talking about being in a position to where every day you wake up, you have the responsibility, right? Or, or you don't have like the school responsibilities, you know? So you're talking about having an insane amount of free time. And now you come to a situation to where not only is your free time not being restricted, but now you're expected to academically perform. Right, and you're expected to academically perform at a high level after having a year and a half of too much free time. Exactly. You know. Exactly. And and I think that, at least from my perspective, I think that's what really, um, I think that's what really did it. You know, yeah. for a lot of students, because when they, you know going to school online, it's not the same as being in the classroom. Right. Right. So in the classroom, you're held accountable more to your behavior. You're held sure. accountable more to your academics. Being online, you're not, you yeah. know, especially in high, especially at high school, you know. And then we also have to take in consideration too, the transition from the transition from middle school to high school is hard enough, you know, when you're actually in the building, right? But now you're talking about doing the rest of your eighth grade year at a computer or your whole eighth grade year at a computer and then ninth well, you know with a whole lot of free time then in ninth grade you you walk into you walk into a high school with 1200 kids yeah that's <laughs> you, a, you know it's a big so change like, absolutely yeah, it's, it's a big change and you know so i think it was just for some students it was just too much at one time you know? i'm sure so, yeah it was it was almost over though. Now, uh, it, it's uh, hopefully, God willing, that we can plow through this school season mm -hmm. and, and hopefully next year, too. But one of the things that I noticed, particularly about the Penn Hill School District, is they have taken a lot of hits with gun violence, and we've lost mm -hmm. a lot of young people. Mm -hmm. You being on the front lines there, how do you help these young people? process that now you've got not only are you a counselor but you are a minister as well so you've got mm -hmm. you've got this credentials to help how do you go about helping these young people process these senseless school shootings and, and i had a cousin who was mm -hmm. uh, a Penn hills student uh and, and was shot last year i mean and it's it, and it just seemed like there was a couple of a string of shootings how do you yeah. help these young people process that that has to be difficult for them yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things to where um, you know our students, you know, they grow up in these neighborhoods, and then you know that then they move to Penn Hills, like you know, like I did, right? right? Um, but sometimes, you know, some of those behaviors follow you, right? Or some of those activities follow you. Yes. Um, and I mean, it was it was unfortunate those three young men. Um, you know, lo lost their lives the way that they did. And because of that, um, a lot of students felt the, the anguish and the pain and the, the hole in their heart as right. a result of, lo of losing these young men. Um, one thing that I give all students 
the space and the freedom. If you need to come and cry, good. My space is for that. Right. You know, come and right. come and cry. You yeah. Know, that, <laughs> sure. There's nothing wrong with that. If you right. Um, because I think that that's really the most important thing is the growth part. Um, because the idea um, is okay. If if this if whatever life you live you live in, if you think you could be next, then you need to change some things. Right? Exactly. Um, just don't don't be the as I say, don't be the next one on the t-shirt. Right. You know? Yeah. No, so, that's yeah. Um, what an analogy. That's true. Yeah, so true. Don't, yeah. Don't be the next one on the t-shirt. That's <laughs> that's that's what, that's one of my sayings. You know, when I tell the kids, don't be the next one on the t-shirt. Wow. Yeah. You know, um, give people their flowers now. Um, give you give your classmates their flowers now because you know we just never know and and you know tragically it was Penn Hills right know? but you know we think about it um it's been going on in the city for a long time it has you know it goes on in the city all the time right, <laughs> right? and it's not indicative the just the Pittsburgh it's it's this is a, right. a crisis right. that's a, around the it's country a, it's that an everywhere thing yes yeah, so thing. yeah no, no honestly and and i i understand what you're trying to do is get these kids to process these grief stages and continue mm -hmm. continuously mm -hmm. move on because the school system is a cycle where you're trying to get them to move to the next cog and continuously mm -hmm. move them so i i'm glad that you explained that uh the way you did now not only are you pastor but soon you will have the title of doctor. Yes. When are you? When are you yes. scheduled to finish school? When are you, yes. you're, getting your, you're getting your doctorates in educational psychology. Yes. You're wearing a lot of hats, brother. Yeah, yeah, man. I'm my, um, I'm a, a doctoral student at Regent University, uh, which is in uh, Virginia Beach. And um, yes, I'm um, currently earning my doctorate in educational psychology, and um, hopefully my target date is December. I'm trying to be done in December. Um, I wanted to be done in May, but had a lot of, you know, things going on and um, stuff. So, but, um, but yeah, man, I'm writing my dissertation on um, negrescence and, um, and motivation nice. amongst young Black youth. Uh, negrescence is the Black identity um, of high school students. Oh, very and, good. Um, and, and how identity uh, affects academic motivation. Okay. So um, that's that's what my research study is going to be on, and and yeah, man. So we just you know going through the dissertation process. Thank you, man, I am I am extremely proud to have met you and, and know you, uh, because you are a star that is bright, and who knows what future lies for you. I think you're you know you are you are on a roll, but I do believe that you are a blessing to these young people, and it's mm -hmm. noticeable. Uh, from me and, and, and Tawana Gatewood, who we, we uh, partner together to do this mentorship at Penn Hills High School. Yeah. And just the way the students uh, respect you and respond to you is we need more of you. If we can clone you mm -hmm. and make a squadron <laughs> <laughs> and make a squadron of you and dispatch you wherever needed, uh, yeah. I, I do believe that you are, you are a very special individual. And in, in addition to calling you pastor, we'll be calling you doctor here in yeah. December. And just, man, keep up what you're doing. Uh, I'm applauding you. And, and I'm sure these young people who, uh, who are under your tutelage are better because you are in this space, man. So you keep up the good work. Mm -hmm. And I look Appreciate forward to that. these Monday sessions at Penn Hills High School and, and getting to work with you and getting to know these, these young kids uh, because they desperately need uh, all the help that they can get. And yeah. you definitely are, are one of these shining points of lights. And, and I appreciate you taking the time on a Friday night. And I know you got young kids mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and coming on to this podcast, man. Uh, our guest for this episode is Pastor Thomas Kilcrease, psychology, Appreciate almost doctorates here, man. What, what a lot of stuff you got going on. Yeah. And, and I appreciate it and look forward to working with you continuously as we move along in this process. Thank you. Appreciate it. Are you, are you in, are you in uh, the, on the weekends? Are you in tomorrow? Yeah, I'll be there tomorrow. Yep. Good I'll be there you. tomorrow. Yep. Good for nine o'clock, 9 a.m. 
Yeah, we'll be there. And uh, we got a few students who, you know, we're going to work with them. And um, we got some cool things going on for them tomorrow. So Outstanding. Yep. Well, yep. I look we'll forward be, to we'll, seeing we'll you. We'll be there. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you. And again, thanks for thanks for coming on this podcast. Our yeah, guest, thank you for having Mr. Me. Thomas Gilcrease, appearing on Project Resurrection, the podcast. Hey, thanks for coming on, man. Looking forward to seeing you. Thank, thank you. All right.